time to get started. Um, as was introduced when I talked earlier today, I have one of the uh, great honors I have at MIT is to be the faculty director of the Despondi Center. And so it's a particular privilege for me to introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon, Desh Despondi, who uh, is the person who had the vision for the center and funded the center and has been omnipresent in helping the center to continue to, to innovate. And he, was, this began with Desh, uh, a very, very successful entrepreneur and uh, somebody with, with uh, um, uh, deep uh, interest in making the world a better place. I think you'll hear about that from him. But he came to MIT and said he would like to start a model center uh, that would really look to take, help faculty take their research to make impact. And that's why this, this innovation impact, I think it's almost like something that uh, we were hearing Dash say this uh, many years ago. And so he came and endowed a center. And this center has generated uh, many startups. Some of the startups you heard present here earlier today were actually alums of the Desponde Center. Uh, but it's been really a, a tremendous asset in, in terms of helping students of MIT and faculty uh, take their technology uh, to market. Uh, Desh also, uh, in, in addition to all of his uh, entrepreneurial things and with, with Desponde, he's been very active, uh, I would say nationwide, in actually uh, promoting uh, this idea of how do we take university research forward. He created a concept called the Sandbox, which now has been emulated here. He also helped establish the, the NSF i program, or, or gave a vision for that with a, a friend of his and the director of NSF at the time, Subar Suresh, also another MIT, a former dean of engineering. Uh, and that's so he's had essentially nationwide impact in, in, in helping academics make that bridge. Uh, he's also done a number of important things. Uh, he feeds, uh, I believe, is it two million people? Uh, two million kids? You're, maybe you'll talk about this, but, but he has methods to, uh, it's damaged an enterprise to feed uh, two million kids in, in uh, India a year to make sure they get quality food and to help them along. So with no further ado, I'd just like to welcome Desh. Welcome. <laughs> you want this or you want the mic no, 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 I got you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I think uh, we all had lunch and we had a lot of heavy duty technology in the morning. So I'm gonna talk something very commonsensical. And the, and the idea is that if we have all these fabulous ideas, how do we create uh, impact with it? And, and so there is, there is a lot of players in this, uh, uh, in, in, in creating the impact. And by impact, I mean both the social impact and the economic impact. So you got universities, you got entrepreneurs, you have the government, you have industry. And then you got two different markets, uh, developed markets and developing markets. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, how, what, what, how the approach would be a little different. So, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, we got 45 minutes, which is a good amount of time. And, and I would like to engage all of us in sort of discussing how the roles of all these entities is changing as we speak. You know, universities started off as temples of knowledge and, and, and they were mostly in, in the business of uh, skilling people and, and giving them all the skills so that they could go and work for things. Uh, that's changing very rapidly because, you know, it's not like a big company does something, the same thing for 50 years and somebody can learn all the skills, go work for the company, and be there for 50 years. I mean, things are changing very rapidly. And so, in some ways, universities are really into two businesses. They, they expand human knowledge, just like we heard this morning. They come up with things that the world has not seen before. And, and so, it's a, it's a supply chain of new ideas. And, and the question is, can we manage the supply chain in a way so that it has economic impact and social impact. Because if it does have impact, then you, you get a very nice cycle where the value of that cycle, the value that you create, comes back into the, into the system, and then you can create even more value. And so, uh, so, so we, and, and that cannot happen 
if you just have university do things by itself. And, and that's why MIT is unique because you know, they do conferences like this where 50% of the people are from outside of MIT. So it's very nice that they reach out. But I think what we should talk today about is, is, is there a more engaged way of, of bringing universities and outside together? And then the industries, you know, industries also, they, they were in business and the same business for a long period of time. So they knew the problems that they had to solve. And so the industry university relationship was primarily coming to universities and saying, you know what, I have this tough problem. Can any of you solve it? But I don't know if that's the real issue anymore. It, it's really because you don't even know all the tools that are available to solve those problems. You know, just like we heard a lot of stuff this morning, most of those ideas is not what we already knew, and then we say, I want to use this idea to solve this problem. Problems get solved in a very different way now. So interacting with universities is almost coming to find out all the new things that are happening, because you don't even know how you're going to be solving your own problems. And so it's very multidisciplinary, right? Uh, for example, within this, these three buildings here between Broad, Whitehead, and Coke, you know, they're working on a lot of life sciences and a lot of cancer research and so on. But it's, it's a really mix of biology, bioengineering, civil engineering, mechanical, electrical, all kinds of stuff, right? So it's, it's very hard for a company to create that kind of an environment where they have unspecified research. They really create a nurturing environment where people can come up with any idea and hopefully they'll all intersect and come up with new solutions that they aren't trying to uh, mandate. And so universities are playing a very unique role in terms of bringing those new ideas to the marketplace, but those new ideas don't go anywhere unless the, the universities uh, interact with it. And I'll talk a little bit more about what are the different uh, ways of interacting. And so, and also, uh, most of the people have global ambitions. You know, if you look at the new MIT campaign, it's all about making a world a better place. And you cannot make a world a better place if you just stick with the top of the market, which is roughly out the seven billion people. Maybe you can break it up into two billion and five billion. And, and so, you know, it's not just the two billion people that will make it a better world. So you have to understand how to sort of operate in the whole thing. And it's not that different for businesses, because there is going to be a lot of growth in the bottom there, and, and we have to find ways to engage with those markets and make sure that it's, it's a part of the expansion. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how it's a little different in the way you would engage in the developed market versus the developing markets. And, and so MIT, uh, uh, you know, Rafael Rafe this morning, you heard from him, and, and he, came up with an op-ed called the Innovation Orchard. So, so he talks about how you need to plow the ground, you know, put the seeds, fertilizers, all the good things that you need to nurture it so that you can actually, it can bear fruits. So to be able to do this, you need the whole ecosystem. You know, you need basic research. You need people who come up with very fundamental ideas that can have an impact over the next 30, 40, 50 years, and then you need people who take a concept and say, maybe this is worth doing it. Then you need proof of concept, proof of product, and then you start up sometimes, and a few of these startups actually work and they scale. Very, very few of them actually become very large companies and become an industry on their own. Most of the times, somewhere in there, they become a part of some larger entity. And so, in the past, all of this was a serial activity. I mean, people would do their own research. After they did the research, they would get their patents, and then the technology licensing offices would go and try to peddle those ideas to other people. And so, so that's very much like the way engineering was 50 years ago. 50 years ago, you know, people designed the product in a dark room somewhere, and then companies hired sales and marketing, and some worked and some didn't work. So the, if, so, so I think you, you can look, look at the professors in the university and say, some of them are doing basic research, and they need to do basic research, and they need to be funded to do basic research. But a majority of the professor at the universities have a desire for impact. So if they have a desire for impact, um, we have to change that model. So instead of they connecting with the real world, 
after they bake the whole idea and then trying to look for applications, if they connect with the market up front, and that's where all of you come in, it's more likely that they'll finish baking the idea, which would have a value. Uh, so, so bringing relevance to what they do is, is, a, is a very key concept. Now, from a big, from an industry perspective, if you're a company, if you have a business, Obviously, basic research, you can't do it anymore, you know, because I think that was the model about 30, 40 years ago when we started our companies in 70s and 80s. Actually, most of the core ideas came from places like Bell Labs. But Bell Labs was viable only when companies like AT&T had monopoly, right? They had full monopoly and they could sort of fund research which did not have to produce an ROI. These days, because of the global competition, uh, people cannot fund basic research. And so basic research has clearly moved back to universities and the US taxpayers spend about $50 billion a year funding that research. And so once, once that research is done, then people come up with these ideas and then you engage. So, so basic research is not what companies can engage in. Now, sometimes what comes out of the research work at MIT is so relevant to what the company is doing that they can work directly with them and, and, and start and take over and license the technology or invest a lot of money and get it done right away. But then in most of the cases, it's still too risky. You don't know whether it's gonna work or not. And, and, and so, so that's where all the, the startup comes in. Because you know, if you have a startup that makes, let's say, a million, 10 million, 50 million, that's like, a super, super, super star startup. But if you're a big company, it's a, it's a rounding error in your top line. And therefore, big companies, it's very hard to do these little startups, or, or a good startup you went to, in a large company. So the companies have to be engaged in this whole process so that they can, they can acquire not the basic research sometimes, not even the basic idea, not even an early startup, but something that's well proven so that they can embrace that expanding market. So, so the industry has to somehow find a way to engage all along that, that whole chain without risking their own investments. And, and that's where I think the public money, the philanthropic money, can, can fund the first part of it. The second part of it, you know, we have a the angel investing and venture capital and, and, and a lot of that kind of access to capital. And then the big companies, I think, have to engage. But, but you cannot start engaging at the very late stage because that's too late. So, so, the, so, so the, I, think, I think here the action item for universities is to see how they can reach out as soon as they think about an idea that they want to have an impact with for industries to start engaging with professors as they bake the idea so that they're on top of it and they can see the risk and they can manage that risk and, 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 and sort of really take advantage of all the new things that are happening. If, and, and so MIT has a whole bunch of activity to make this happen. You know, there's, there's programs for students and academic and commercialization, alumni. And I'll talk a little bit more about the Dishpande Center where that fits in. Uh, but it's, it's a big ecosystem, and, and there's a lot of different places where all of you can get engaged. Um, so, so let me talk a little bit about my own journey in terms of engaging with that developed market and the developing market, and, and maybe that'll lead to some thoughts that, so that we can engage in terms of how both MIT and all of you can engage to your mutual benefits. So I, I got educated in India. I did my undergraduate there, then came to Canada, did my master's, and then did PhD, taught for a year, worked for Motorola for about eight years, and then moved to Boston, and then uh, did a whole bunch of startups. But for the last probably 15 years or so, uh, I've been sort of fascinated by how do you create more opportunities like the ones we had. You know, being a, an entrepreneur, and building a company is just the most exciting uh, part of my life. I mean, it's, it's you, you do things that you didn't know you could do, and it's just a very fulfilling experience. 
So, and, and most of the companies, like I said, had come from uh, Bell Labs and the ideas from those places. But by year 2002, uh, there was no more Bell Labs. So, so the reason why I got involved at MIT was to see if, if places like MIT, which are already doing a pretty good job, could do even better in terms of creating opportunities for a lot of entrepreneurs and have bigger impact with their whole thing. So the basic idea behind this center is how do you bring relevance to innovation? What do I mean by that? For example, this morning, we heard from a lot of professors, a lot of great ideas, right? But, and, and they all have some idea of where they're gonna have the impact. And you can't manage it too closely or mandate it too closely because then it, it, the innovation part of it goes away. You have to give them full freedom to do what they need to do. But then, if you go talk to the same professor and the researchers, the students, two months from now, they'll have 10 more ideas because that's what they are. They are just idea machine, right? And so the key value to be added that all of you can add is helping them pick and choose which of those 10 ideas to pursue. What happens today in, in, a, in a very nurturing environment, doesn't matter whether it's a university, think tank, or, or just research labs in uh, companies and so on, to create a nurturing environment, you do have to create a certain amount of freedom, a certain amount of culture. But that culture becomes clubby. And when it becomes clubby, it naturally has a tendency to move further and further away from the real world. And so even though people have a true desire for impact, they all get more into impressing each other than the impact, because that's a very natural behavior of, of any environment, right? And, and so, so good papers come out of it and good publications come out of it. Even though they have a true desire for impact, that impact is not seen because, because they're doing things that their colleagues think are important. Whereas when, when people like yourself start getting involved with, with that, helping them pick and choose which of those 10 ideas to pursue, it's more likely that they'll pursue a path which is more likely to have a pull in the marketplace. And if it does have a pull in the marketplace, then either it becomes a company or gets licensed or has, finds some way to have an impact on the world. And, and so the Deshpande Center so far in the last 15 years has funded, I don't know, maybe 130, 140 different small projects and, and quite a few of them, 30, 40 of them have become companies. So, so this is a process that works. And the only reason this works is, is because people from outside of MIT get involved. Uh, and it's very important that they not be too tightly coupled with MIT. They cannot be on the payroll of MIT. You know, there is technology licensing offices, but they're all on the payroll of MIT. Once you come inside, you sort of lose your value. The value that all of you bring is only because you practice whatever it is that you do outside. And so, so I think the more, and MIT is sort of really trying to encourage more and more people to get involved and make it easier and easier for them, and, and this conference is, is, is part of that effort, to make sure that you get involved early. And, and the earlier you get involved, the more likely it is that that effort that goes into that research will, will bear a fruit. So, so and, and this is like at MIT, it's, it's fairly well proven. And like Tim was saying, it's become a part of the NSF uh, uh, program, i -Corps. And also, we run a university innovation network where more than 100 universities are now a part of that learning process of, of expanding knowledge. And, and if you actually find something that's really valuable, how to train students so that they can take those ideas forward. And then uh, we have a couple of more. This is more the Dishpande Foundation program, where we have centers in places where I went to school and my wife went to school. Uh, but, but this is something interesting. Maybe not something that all of you have thought a lot about. This is not what I had thought about t until 10 years ago because most of the companies that I built were all for the developed economy, right? They were all very innovative, new technologies, things that the world has not seen before. Quite a few of them were in telecom business. And, and so, so constantly it was, it was the leading edge of the whole thing. 
But about 10 years ago, my wife is also from India, so we said, what can we do in India? So we said, let's do social innovation. When you do social innovation, in technological innovation, you're selling to a developed economy, which means the people, the customers that you sell to, uh, have disposable income, they're fairly well to do, and so if they have a problem, they're looking for a solution, right? And if they're looking for a solution, if you come up with an idea that the world has not seen before, and you direct it to some burning problem in the world, it sort of has an impact because people would naturally buy it. And over the last 50 years, we've actually developed a pretty nice ecosystem for that. You know, we have access to capital, we have a lot of distribution channels now, but it doesn't matter whether it's Amazon or Walmart or all these things, and, and, and there's, there's ways to promote it and all that kind of stuff. So, so the ecosystem for the developed markets is well developed. So finding relevance to ideas that the world has not seen before is, is one of the key values that you add to be successful within that ecosystem, even though there's, you still have to cross 1,000 bridges and you could fall off any one of them. And, and you may not be successful, but the chances are pretty good that if you have a strong, powerful idea and you direct it to some burning problem in the world, you'll be successful. In, in the developing markets, it's a little different. I mean, you're trying to solve the problems of the people who live on $2 a day, $4 a day, $8 a day. It's not like they have disposable income. You know, they're just trying to get by uh, in, the, in their life, right? And so, it's not like they have, they're looking for solutions. It's not that these poor people are saying, where do I get my clean water? Which, where do I Google and get the ad and, and, and buy it for cheaper or all that kind of stuff, right? So, so it's not a developed market. So there's no distribution channels. It's not like it's a ready-made market. And therefore, instead of leading with innovation, you have to lead with relevance. And meaning it's the, understanding, a deep understanding the problem itself, which is the core competence, and co-creating the solution with them is a, is, is a key thing to get that process going. And so we started this program about 10 years ago in India. Uh, we, we built a center called these for social entrepreneurship. And, and, and so in the last 10 years, what you've learned is that to get this process going, to, to really sort of close the ground for this uh, social entrepreneurship and social change. Number one, you have to build capacity. That is, you have to have a lot of people who can take a solution to a lot of these people. Because otherwise, it's not like you can put Amazon.com and, and the solution just spreads out, right? So you need a lot of people who can actually um, spread the solution out. And then you have to co-create the solution because the customer base, you know, usually it's very hard to build a company if you don't relate to the, your customers, because, because that's how you get all your customer requirements. And so when you live a very different life than the people that you're trying to help, it's very hard for you to actually design products that make sense. And therefore, you have to co-create the solution with the people they need it. And you know you have a good solution when there is a pull, right? And so this is what we have done over the last 10 years, but I think the next Space is where it's, it's really interesting because you need all the skills of the innovative world to come back into it. So let me just give you some examples. So for example, building the capacity, we, uh, we have a program where uh, young men and women, eight to 25 years old, uh, it's amazing that within four months you can change the mindset of these people. You know, it's like a boot camp and we do 5,000 people a year now. So we just built this campus, it's a 300,000 square foot campus, where we trained 5,000 young men and women. And, and it's amazing to see the excitement that they have and the, they're just like any other entrepreneurs, right? And, and, and we never had a graduate so far who doesn't have a job. So, and about two, three percent of them come up with their own ideas. And, and so what happens is this army of people, 5,000 people a year, become the workhorse for any for-profit, non-profit company that you get going. And, and so, and, and they don't make a lot of money, you know. They make about, you know, $4 a day is about what they make, right? I mean, about eight, ten thousand 10,000 rupees a month. So 
so, so you really have to build this whole infrastructure of thousands of hundreds and thousands of people before some very innovative person can come up with a solution and, and bring it to these markets. And so building this capacity is very important. And also we have a, a 100,000 square foot incubator now where when these people come up with ideas, they can incubate and, and come up with the solutions. And then we have funded, and this whole thing, the social initiative sandbox works like a, a living lab where people can come and experiment with different ideas. We funded about 136 of them, and about 22 of them are actually looking pretty good. And, and so uh, I'm going to give you just examples of three of them. Um, this is the one that Tim talked about. So this is a, uh, you know, a lot of children in India come hungry to school. So this organization said, well, let's use advanced engineering, supply chain, procurement, accounting, all the good stuff. And they built a kitchen in this sandbox. This one kitchen makes 185,000 meals a day, right? 185,000 meals. It's all local produce, local cuisine, so it's food that children really love. And it only costs 12 cents to make a meal. We serve only the government schools, and the government gives us the money they would have spent otherwise, which is $15 a year. And we raise other $15, and we've been scaling it, and now we're at 1.6 million uh, meals a day. Right, every day, every day, these guys make 1.6 million meals, and so the the but there's 100 million children who need to be fed. So so now that there is a basic technology, you can see how you, these guys are now ready to number one, their problems are bigger now because it's 50, 60 million dollar a year operation. So they could use a lot of technology. They could use a lot of financial engineering a lot of new things to actually scale these programs to 100 million. So, so because there's 5 billion, right? I mean, we need to scale these not to a million, but more like a billion. And to go from here to the next step, I think we need a lot of MIT. We need a lot of the industry. We need a lot of the developed economies to actually help scale once they get to this place. For example, uh, this is a program for the farmers where you know, when, when people have farming, um, water is the biggest multiplier of income. So if you dig a hole that's 100 feet by 100 feet by 12 feet, you can actually uh, irrigate five acres of land, and that immediately doubles and triples the income. So we have a lot of those machines, and those machines crank out uh, a farm pond every 40 hours nonstop. So we've got 30 of those machines cranking away. And so now the farmers, now that they have water, they're looking for lots of other things. So for example, one of the teams at MIT is working on soil testing. You know, a lot of the farmers in India, they farm, but they have no facility to do farm testing, uh, the soil testing. And so the only soil testing facilities people have is you have to send it away to some government lab and maybe four weeks down the road, you'll get some result. So 99.99% of the farmers never do soil testing. So it's like having a healthcare system without ever having done a blood test, right? And so, 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 so all those guys are now ready to accept new approaches and new ways of doing things. And so, uh, but, but unless you have a system of reaching a lot of farmers and having credibility with them, you cannot take those solutions to them. Uh, same thing with chronic malnutrition program where you can come up with pretty simple systems that can solve the problem. But then, you know, it's a big country uh, with 620,000 villages, right? So, so we can do 100 villages, but taking it out to 600,000, we need a lot of big systems. So, so what the lesson I've learned from going to the developing market, whether it's a company or, or big thinkers in universities, is you cannot sort of just take a solution to those guys. What you need is first you have to build this base of people who, who know the customer base, who have a trust, who have a certain capacity to understand what you're talking about. Because collaborations can only happen between two strong people. Collaborations don't happen between a strong and a weak. So a lot of times with the multinationals, they try to enter these markets. They, they take the same product and, and use a little bit of a heavy-handed approach to get into these markets and they just fail miserably, right? 
So, or, or university professors, when they try to come up with solutions for a lot of these Africa and India and a lot of the developing economies, uh, very few of them actually have an impact. They just remain to be ideas because there's no receptacle on the other side. So if you want to address the developing market, you have to have a very conscious way to build the capacity to be able to absorb those ideas. But once you have that ability to actually use bigger ideas, then I think you need all these things. You need, you need big companies entering those markets to scale those things. You need technology platforms. You need financial engineering. You need all the good stuff that you need. So in summary, I think uh, if, we, if you want to have bigger impact, we have to have innovators, industries, and entrepreneurs. They have to come together. And they have to come together in, in the entire supply chain, not uh, supply chain, not sort of hand over from one side to another side to another side because that's not a very efficient way to manage a supply chain. And, and so maybe we can have a discussion on, on how, to, how to do that part. And, and secondly, if, if you want to have, if you want to address and win market share in the developing economies, you cannot lead with big ideas. You have to first lead with relevance. You have to build capacity there. You have to build the ability to absorb bigger ideas and then slowly start injecting bigger ideas. And so the approaches are a little different, but if you want to have global impact, you have to learn how to do both of them. And so with those comments, I would love to, we have plenty of time, so I'd love to open discussion for uh, how you think you can engage and what should MIT do to facilitate that engagement. Okay, well, Dash will uh, entertain some questions. We have some from the audience. Oh, Vladimir. Yeah. So, uh, Dash, uh, one way that the Indian market can, can be described to us engineers is we need to engineer frugally. Um, as I look in that direction, are there obvious low-lying low opportunities, very quick ones that we could start addressing and would make significant uh, value. You said soil engineering being one. I imagine water testing, smog, or quality of air conditioning. Are there other uh, spoilage of milk or? Well, I mean, like I, mean I, th I think it's everywhere, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, entrepreneurs, every time you see a problem, it's an opportunity. You get excited. The beauty of places like India, doesn't matter which way you turn, there's a problem. <laughs> so, so it's just full of opportunities, right? And, and it's a very interesting country because on, on one side, you know, like when I left India in 1973, um, I, I graduated in computer science, but I'd never seen a computer, right? And so the way the professors taught us computers, computer programming, was they would, uh, for example, those days it was Fortran, they taught us Fortran, they would give us an assignment, and we would write a program on the paper, give it back to the professor, the professor would say syntax error and give it back to us. <laughs> and we would correct it and give it back to him and he would say, okay, you know, you got it right. So, so, you know, that was the stage of the country in terms of the disconnect between technology, let's say here and technology there was huge. The confidence level, there was no confidence level. You know, when we got, the, when India got the independence, uh, there was very little wealth, very little, uh, very few companies that were built and everything else. But now, um, there's a lot of several global companies that are built. So out of the 1.2 billion people, I would say 1% of the population now, which is like 12 million people, are globally as competent as anybody else anywhere else. And that, that's in engineering, in finance, in legal, everything. You know, like they're globally as competent as anybody else. And so that 1% of the population now, also there's about 60, 70 percent of the population, that's really very poor. So you have these huge problems right in front of you, and you have the global talent, and it's that intersection that creates all this frugal uh, innovation. And, and so, uh, you know, for example, you can create that meal for 12 cents. I mean, you, you can't even imagine that, right? And so, so there's a lot of those opportunities, and so people talk a lot about how reverse innovation is gonna happen, 
for example, in medical, right? I mean, blood testing, for example. You know, uh, George Whiteside here, he's working on a lot of things. He's taking a lot of stuff to the sandbox there where it's all paper testing, right? So less than 10 cents, you can actually get the blood test done. Now, that product can never be introduced in US. Number one, uh, you know, the efficacy of that test is probably not all that great right now. And also, it, it is so disruptive in terms of the business model that people here would never accept it. I mean, the industry would never accept it. And so, the way things will happen is that it'll probably go to places like India, and there'll be 100 million tests done in the next like, maybe four or five years. And then it all gets very mature, and then it'll come back as a reverse innovation. But then it'll be used in a big way. I mean, it's, it, for example, ultrasound. You know, ultrasound used to be a very expensive thing, but now in a lot of India, China, and so on, it's all handheld ultrasound for low, very low cost. So now all that technology has come back here. But now what happens is, instead of having just one ultrasound for the whole hospital, you'll have them like lots of different places. Right? So, so it's not like the companies that we started in the 70s and 80s, the technology went from US to other places. In fact, in telecommunications, first company that I did, Cascade Communications, when the internet was just happening, we would design the products, sell it in US for five years, and then take it to Europe, sell there for five years, and then take it to Japan. And then maybe 20 years later, you took it to India and China. Right? And, and any way you expanded the market was always taking things that you'd done here and just find a distribution way to sell it there. That doesn't work anymore. So you almost have to innovate right there because you're, you're innovating at a very different cost point. But then the innovation will go both ways. It'll go from here to there, and then it'll also come from there to here. And so I think, and, and if, if we don't watch out, then I think people here will be just sitting in a bubble and, and they will lose it. Because innovation is all about coming up with a solution at a certain price point. And, and what that benchmark is for the price point will shift dramatically once you get all those economies coming into the uh, global equation. So. so one thought I, had Desh and your expanding the talent pool and your your educational mission in India is uh, that this this connect there you're developing talent locally, but then there's connecting industry U.S. and developed countries industry to them, and there still seems to be a divide there between you know we have people on the ground that that can know the relevance, but really making a, a detailed connection. I know there's some things going on at MIT that, just for the, our guests, that where some students can, can get fellowships that take them, in particular, to India, the Tata Center yeah. in, in particular, and also the Gautam Center also does uh, programs like this. But have you any ideas on of, of how to maybe make that bridge more completely with your missions in India? So, so Tata, Ratan Tata, I. A lot of you may have heard of him. He's sort of the Rockefeller of India. So he <laughs> funded Tata Fellows at MIT. The idea being that people here can do their uh, masters and PhD and uh, whatever they need to do here, but have an impact on India with the work that they're doing. And, and we work very closely with them. In mm. fact, this year in August, the new Tata Fellows, the group of Tata Fellows, they'll go and spend two weeks on that campus to get oriented to and get exposed to uh, what, is, what is a customer and, and what are the real issues in India and so on. So we work closely with them. But let me tell you how, how the, what I mean by this peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So what happens is that a lot of times these guys, they go there with a solution. And, and because those guys are pretty strong now, uh, they will probably argue with these guys and say, hey, you guys are totally screwed up. You don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and so. MIT comes back with a, a totally new perspective of what the customer requirements are. I mean, obviously, those people don't understand nanotechnology, mm -hmm. but they know the customer base. For example, for the soil testing, these guys identified that it's an important product, but they were thinking very differently. So MIT team came back here and started working on the product, and they wanted to design a meter for about $10 and do a little strip uh, for maybe... Uh, 50 cents, 
that you just put in the soil and then you get the reading. But then they thought they had to design this thing for the farmer. And so they were working on all kinds of this thing where you would send an SMS back to something and you'd get a very simple answer back to the farmer and all that kind of stuff. When they went and saw there, uh, we have this concept called a, a village consultant. So we have one of our graduates in a village who is sort of like the translator of new things to existing farmers. So they said, no, 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 you don't need to do that. You can do a meter that costs $200 because this one guy is going to buy it and then he's going to run it as a business. He's going to do this soil testing for all the farmers and help them interpret what it is. So we don't need a meter to be $10, it can be $200. The reading does not have to be very friendly, but it has to be very accurate. So, so certainly the product design specifications change, and that insight you'd have never gotten if you had just sat here. Mm -hmm. So that interaction, I think, is, is very important. That's good. Other questions from the audience? Back, back there, yes. is presented to us, and how can we simply and quickly test things out and provide directions like you, you're describing without committing a million dollars? It would seem to be a nice price tag that people seem to request. And then the other one is, how can you guys also help us by providing exactly what you described, which is those prototyping and perspectives? Because I think, you know, when you look at these ideas, we, we're in the same problem, which is, Many of our uh, products fail because we've got the wrong, we got the wrong idea as to what people really want. And right. that, that would be a nice, nice perspective or a different angle from a university. So how can you also facilitate with those things? Because we can't right. always reach out. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think Deshpande Center here runs a program called Catalyst. And Catalyst are usually entrepreneurs or executives or venture capitalists who have a lot of d domain knowledge. And they typically volunteer maybe one or two days a month. And so would love to see a lot of you sort of participate as catalysts so that we have insight into what you're thinking and whom you're touching, everything else. And then a catalyst is surrounded by five or 10 expert volunteers from the same domain, right? So, so I think collectively, uh, when you bring people together, it's a lot easier to see where are the best applications for this technology, where do we prototype it, and so on. So I think, I think we can strengthen that ecosystem a lot more by getting a lot more people involved and also making it easy for you. You know, I think it's a, MIT is not the easiest place to navigate if you don't know where to go, right? And so what the Dishpani Center is trying to do is to make it easy for you to navigate the whole system. So every year we have a, uh, a conference called Idea Stream, which is sort of similar to this, but it's not just limited to nano sensor technology, it's all kinds of different technologies. So I think, I think MIT can do a lot more of that, and that's what they're trying to do with the innovation orchard and so on. But, but let us know, I mean, if there's a way we can get your names and so on, we will reach out to you and make sure that there's an easy way for you to connect back into MIT and get exposed to a lot of the different things that are happening. There are any last questions? One, one more question. Yeah. Anu. So, excellent. Uh, this, thank you very much. Social entrepreneurship is awesome. Uh, question. You mentioned that every way you turn, you see a problem. Is there like a database of problems which then people can look at and say, I have a hammer that can hit this nail? Well, you know, I think, I think if smart people want to get engaged with that thing, unfortunately, what I found is that smart people the compassion is very genuine, the fact that they want to help all these people. But they start with the wrong question. The question they always ask is, what is it that I can give that I have? And most of the smart people say, I got the brains. So I'll come up with a solution. And that's the wrong approach, right? So 
I think what you have to do is you have to build partnership with somebody who's already, let's say you want to help people with clean water. So you need to first start with an organization that's already serving clean water to, let's say, a million people or something like that. So now to go from a million to billion, let's say he is able to clean water today at two cents a liter, and you have a technology to make it one cent. If a guy is already doing a million liters, he can use your technology, he'll understand the technology, absorb the technology. So you don't want to start with a list of problems, but you want to start with connections to some passionate people who are actually doing something, and they can brainstorm with you and, and get better ideas. So I think looking for those receptacles who can actually absorb those ideas is, I think, is the, is the key difference between uh, the developed markets and developing markets. In developed markets, I think you know, there's so, so much entrepreneurship now in Boston, Silicon Valley, everything else. Everybody is looking for a problem to solve. In fact, the biggest problem for entrepreneurs right now is that they're running out of problems, right? So everybody says, I have an app that will save your life. Let me show you, you know? So, so it's, 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 it's hard for entrepreneurs to get problems that are worth solving because most of the time, that's what you're trying to market yourself, that this will save your life. Whereas in those places, there's enough problems, but there's not enough compassionate entrepreneurs who can scale them. So developing compassionate entrepreneurs to actually take them and bring them to a certain scale so that they're ready for bigger ideas is, I think, uh, the key idea. Great. Well, okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. A truly inspirational way that we could all you know, hope to change the world in just a small fraction of what you've done. Um, I think that's really what, what gets us out of bed in the morning.